lecture. Um, Judith couldn't be with us today. Judith Swift is the director of the Coastal Institute, and she sends her regrets. So she sent me to take her place. And she gave me a whole list of things I have to tell you here. <laughs> first of all, we are delighted to have Carlos Duarte as our first distinguished guest on this annual lecture series. The Coastal Institute is sponsoring this event. And I'm particularly pleased to tell you that Carlos Duarte has donated his honorarium to the, to the support of the GSO students. <laughs> On behalf of Judith, I'd like to thank all the people who helped organize this event, uh, particularly Deb Cody, who kept us online and was taking care of all the details. Also, I want to thank Sarah Hickox of the Office of Marine Programs. Uh, she's been the quintessential good partner in helping out where needed. And you can tell that Judith picks that word. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to re express the regrets of Dean Bruce Corliss, who's been called to Washington, D.C., intended to be here today, but he was unable to make it. This lecture is being live cast. Everything I say up here is being broadcast. I bet Judith is watching. <laughs> And uh, finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robinson Fulweiler, who will share with us some of her thoughts <coughs> about Scott Nixon and the contributions he's made to equestrian science. And goodness knows what else she'll say. <laughs> um, thank you all. Thank you, Candace. I'm going to actually try to go behind this podium so that you all don't see my notes, because I feel like I'm cheating with notes. Um, so it's sort of a bittersweet thing to be here today, obviously, and it's really quite wonderful to see this room so packed. Um, Scott Nixon was a remarkable intellectual force in the field of coastal ecology, and his work redefined how we understand the world around us. We could speak at length of his many accomplishments, which we're not going to do today. Um, instead, I'll just feel obliged to tell you some of the basic facts, um, and then we get to listen to Carlos. So, Scott received his BA in biology from the University of Delaware, and he did his PhD with H.T. Odom at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He came to the Graduate School of Oceanography as a research associate before he'd even finished his PhD, which is unheard of these days. So, my students, if you're watching, don't get any ideas. <laughs> um, let's see. <clears throat> um, as soon as he, he was here, he was hired pretty quickly after that as an assistant professor, and he stayed here for the remainder of his career. Um, over the course of his tenure here, he had 17 master students and 20 PhD students. Um, he, of course, held numerous other positions while here at GSO. So, for example, he was elected to ASLO's governing board between 1984 and 1987. He was on the editorial board of several journals, including Estuaries and Coasts, most recently. Um, he was the director of Rhode Island Sea Grant Program for 14 years, between 1986 and 2000. And he was also the UNESCO CUSTO Chair in Coastal Ecology. Scott was recognized for his numerous achievements with various awards, um, including the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute's B.H. Ketchum Award for Coastal Excellence in 1992. He received the Odom Lifetime Achievement Award um, from the Estuarine Research Federation in 2003. And most recently, he received the Citation for Scientific Excellence from the Association for the, Sun Sci for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography. Um, I suppose it might also be appropriate to talk about things like his H index or um, various heavily cited papers. For example, his Ophelia paper where he defined eutrophication has over 1,400 citations. But in truth, his legacy is much more than the average number of citations for his papers. Beyond his many career activities, I believe it was his intellectual generosity and passion he worked with every day that was so inspiring. Scott had an amazing ability to see what no one else saw. And it is this creative and clear insight that fundamentally changed our understanding of marine um, systems. And that is why we're here today, to celebrate this work and the work of others who share similar insights and motivations. And I believe Carlos is really the perfect person to, to um, head off this series. And so with that, I believe Autumn will be introducing Carlos. So. So 
So I'm on the planning committee, and I am so glad that I gave that job to Wally because she did a wonderful job. Um, a little bit about Carlos. We, first of all, we are so pleased that you were able to be here and come and give the first Scott Nixon lecture. You were the first person that came to our minds, and we're just so glad to have you. Um, Carlos, Dr. Duarte got a PhD in limnology at McGill under Jacob Kulf, who was a very well-known limnologist, but it didn't take him very long before he went to the saltier side, and he is best known as being a marine systems ecologist. Um, Dr. Duarte's CV is over 70 pages. He has co-authored over 400 peer-reviewed publications. Over 100 of them are first authored. He has written or co-written 17 books. He has advised 26 completed PhD students, 10 master's students, and 16 postdocs. I believe that he has worked in every continent in the world. Um, <laughs> he has um, published papers on topics ranging from submerged aquatic vegetation to phytoplankton to fish to bacteria to mangrove to nutrients. And currently he holds two positions. The first is as the director of the University of Western Australia Oceans Institute, and then the second is as a research professor at the Spanish National Research Council at the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Studies in Majorca. Um, and he has won so many different awards and honors and served in committees. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight before um, letting him talk is if you read through his CV, you see these certain words coming up over and over again. Words like scaling, comparative, trends, patterns. Since his earliest publications, he has these, this broader perspective, this ecosystem level perspective that pervades all of his work. And that's why he is such a wonderful choice. He has this amazing CV, which is fabulous and wonderful, but he also is able to look at things at a very broad level and compare across systems. Um, and he's also uh, not afraid to take on somewhat controversial issues and address them in a systematic and thoughtful way. So with that, thanks. Thank you, Autumn. So before I start, I'd like to share my condolences for the losses and the injured in the bombing in Boston two days ago. I know that many of you have uh, either leave or have family or friends in Boston, and I wanted to just acknowledge that uh, my sympathy and my condolences. And uh, I'd like to uh, start also by, by saying how honored I am by and privileged by being here today and being the inaugural uh, lecturer to the Scott Nixon Annual Lecture. So it is, it is a privilege and an undeserved honor. And uh, one of the traits of Scott is, is that he was a wonderful speaker. He had a wonderful voice and, and a wonderful way of presenting. And it's a bit awkward that the first person that's going to speak on his behalf in the series has such an awful accent <laughs> and, is, and is so poorly articulated. But perhaps at the same time, it also speaks of the very broad impact of Scott's research internationally. And I think we have all been inspired by Scott around the world. And perhaps then there is merit in having somebody from outside the US, even though uh, putting up with my accent to present this lecture. So I had the privilege of meeting Scott in several conferences and speaking with him. And he was always one of my intellectual heroes and, and one of my scientific heroes. But I got to spend some quality time with him as we were both uh, co-editors in chief of the journal Estories, now Estories and Coasts, for maybe six years. And we had to sit through every year through board meetings of the Estuarian Research Federation, which were not particularly amusing. So we used to take a corner in the room and chat <laughs> with each other and exchange jokes, and also develop some, some closer uh, intellectual relations. So during those six years, we shared our interest and concern about the problems that affect the coastal ocean globally and, and the fact that the pro problems seem to be mounting and growing in number at a faster pace that we can address them. So slowly we developed uh, the concept that we were going to work on a book called with the working title of Fixing Nature, 
which was about our efforts, not our own efforts, but our collective efforts in the, from the scientific community to try to address these problems, particularly in the coastal environments and the challenges in addressing those problems, and also, um, also uh, the nature of the problems and the priority in which they ought to be addressed. Unfortunately, that book couldn't be completed, but I'm glad to uh, report that uh, Wally Fulweiler has, has agreed to uh, work on that book uh, with me. So we will be soon working on that book and, and bring it to completion, I hope, and dedicate it to the memory of uh, Scott. But uh, so to, today we'll be talking about that. And the topic of uh, today's lecture is about auditing the seven plagues of the coastal ocean. And it's about all these problems that are affecting the coastal ocean and try to put some rationale into them in, and priority into which problems we need to take very seriously and start addressing and which problems perhaps we need to rethink, because we have too many of those. But b before I move into the problems, I'd like to share some other elements of Scott, and is that also during those six years, I, I got to learn that in addition to a wonderful scientist, Scott is a kind, was a kind individual, kind, intelligent, sharp, and gracious and generous, and had a very sharp sense of humor. So I, I actually doubted, uh, hesitated to share much about my own experience with Scott because many of you know, knew him much better than I, than I do. But in any case, I'm going to share a recent exchange between emails that I think portrays well Scott's personality and those traits that I mentioned. But I, also, I, I think that it also shows that he was a very humble individual and perhaps it also contains some lessons for students today. So this was about um, an exchange of emails about a paper where we were trying to uh, look at the recovery of estuarine systems from nutrient reductions after eutrophication. So we wrote a paper and submitted to Limnology and Sonography, and uh, the reviewer for Limnology and Sonography uh, recommended rejection and said that I'm not sure this manuscript pushes the field much farther than Scott Nixon did in earlier papers. And the text highlights some papers that have made minor additions to the field, but is unduly lacking in acknowledging Nixon's major and earlier contributions along these lines. So I was, I was nervous that we could have possibly be unfair to the contributions of Scott. So what I did is I wrote Scott and asked him, well, we wrote this paper and uh, we received this, this, uh, these comments from the reviewer. What do you think of the statements? So uh, Scott said, hello, Carlos. So this is about, about a year and a half ago, more or less. Uh, I apologize for taking so long to respond. But in addition to the complications I wrote to you about earlier, I discovered that you did not give me an easy task. I found this manuscript a heavy read. Like many of our fine Scandinavian colleagues, Jacob is very fond of his statistical modeling. Jacob is the first author of the paper, but does not write with the grace of a Ragmar Eldrin. Reading much of it may be rich for my aspirin. <laughs> Too many logs, plots of residual, power functions, boss weak reports. The only blessing was an absence of non-dimensional scaling <laughs> and stress analysis. But I also wanted to read it closely enough that I might be able to say something useful. How successful I was in that I leave to your judgment. So then uh, he went on and said that I, I appreciated the reviewer's kind words. I wish my papers would get sent to him, her, <laughs> to review rather than to the pit bulls they usually end up with. Uh, but I don't believe I have ever plotted Crowfield versus Total Nitrogen in a publication. I don't, I don't believe that I was prescient enough to suggest that nutrient reduction might produce the idiosyncratic behavior you seem to be finding. I wish I had been. My simple, maybe simple-minded goal beginning many years ago was to try to apply volume by this approach to marine systems and try to relate nutrient loadings to nutrient concentrations. So I don't think Carstensen et al., which is the paper we have submitted, duplicates my past efforts. So that's very humble and general of his to <laughs> say that. Now, um, the manuscript was resubmitted to Limnology and Sonography, <laughs> uh, and, it, and it was rejected. So I informed Scott of the outcome, and he wrote, I am sorry to hear about the LNO decision. I'm sure you will not let that discourage you from getting your results 
uh, published out elsewhere, and it was published in Environmental Science and Technology. And I have to say, I pretty much gave up on that note when they flat out rejected our paper showing the warming of southern New England coastal water using 117-year-long measurements record from Woods Hole. The reviewers were both wanted the data interpreted in the context of larger North Atlantic numerical modeling results. Good grief. <laughs> Since when are solid observational data no longer of interest? Hmm. I guess I'm a, a little bitter. Thank goodness. <laughs> Estoys and Coast had a completely different response. My best, Scott. So uh, that's the end of the, of the quotes, but I think it shows first that everybody struggles to get their work published, <laughs> even as Scott, and absolutely I do struggle to get my work published, but it shows how, how gracious as Scott was. He actually dedicated a lot of time to look at our manuscript and provided a very clever and important input to our manuscript, but how humble he was, because he had indeed made major contributions to this research area that we were addressing. But uh, this, this uh, is not really what I was going to talk about, but I was going to talk about the problems in the coastal ocean, and I made reference to the plagues, the seven plagues. So the biblical plague is described in this quote from the Exodus. This is what the Lord said. By this you will know that I am the Lord with the stuff that is in my hand, possibly fertilizer, I put in a footnote. <laughs> I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood, the fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. And thus the Egyptian will not be able to drink its water. Now, uh, thankfully, Scott and Autumn actually did something about it, and they published a paper in, uh, a few years ago uh, about the enhancement of fisheries in the Nile River plume in Egypt. So even though uh, fertilizer has been demonized as being bad, and nitrogen is being bad, in fact, Nitrogen is a good thing, but what is bad is too much of a good thing. So uh, in the Nile River, the, the uh, fishery of, anchovy, of uh, sardines had collapsed with the construction of the Aswan River that prevented the, the input of sediments that fertilized the Mediterranean in the mouth of the, of the Nile River to uh, be delivered to the ocean. And then uh, use of fertilizer in the basin actually led to uh, a recovery of the fishery yield even going above the present levels. So that problem that had been, that had been cursed to the Egyptians in the biblical plague was solved out and figured out by Autumn and Scott and co-workers. But we still find narratives that resemble of the biblical plagues. And this, for instance, is a paper uh, published in Science in 2001 that has been public, uh, cited 3,000 times to uh, April 13, and it's called the historical overfishing and the recent collapse of coastal ecosystem. And the narrative of that paper is actually very close to the biblical narratives and, the, and, the, and even the language. Overfishing pre precedes all other pervasive human disturbance to coastal ecosystems, including pollution, degradation of water quality and anthropogenic climate change. The litany of changes includes increased sedimentation and turbidity, enhanced episodes of hypoxia or anoxia, loss of seagrass and dominant suspension feeders, with a general loss of oyster reef habitat shifts, shifts from ecosystems once dominated by benthic primary production to those dominated by planktonic primary production, eutrophication, enhanced microbial production, high, and higher frequency and duration of nuisance algal and toxic dinoflagellate blooms, outbreak, outbreaks of jellyfish and fish kills. So really a very comprehensive plague in the coastal ocean that was depicted here. And the same author elaborated further into these plagues uh, with similar narratives about the many problems that affect the coastal ocean. And indeed, if we look at the development of these pressures on the ocean, the coastal ocean, uh, overfishing, there's evidence of overfishing from, for instance, in Spain, from medieval times in uh, the 1300s, there was al already evidences of collapses of stocks because of overfishing. Then uh, eutrophication came as a problem in the coastal ocean, followed by coastal sprawl and the tra transformation of the shorelines of the coastal waters, hypoxia, ocean warming, ocean acidification, and we keep adding problems as we progress. So we can actually summarize the seven plagues of the coastal ocean as increased jellyfish blooms, increased harmful algal blooms, fish kills, uh, proliferation of invasive species, 
a decline of calcifying organisms, a decline of vegetated coastal habitats, and a decline of megafauna. And the drivers of these uh, plagues are overfishing, eutrophication, habitat alteration, pollution inputs, oceanification, hypoxia, and warming. And if we look at these plagues and these drivers, it is actually very hard to find out where are we going to start solving this mess. And I was discussing today that a student that wants to do a PhD came to talk to me two weeks ago and said about topics for our research. And we discussed a little bit what the topics will be. And she said, well, you know, those topics are very nice, but I really want to solve global change in my PhD. So, said, well, your first chapter, your first chapter will, will solve uh, climate change. Your second chapter will take care of uh, <laughs> global pollution loads. The third chapter will take care. I think it takes a, a, little, a little harder to solve problems. And these are big problems that are difficult to, hard, to, to, to solve. So, but if we look at this list of plagues that we can take from different papers, including those that I quoted, then some of them, there's actually very ro robust evidence that those problems are global in scope and they're major. And that includes, for instance, in the drivers, overfishing, eutrophication, habitat alteration, pollution inputs, I leave ocean acidification for the time being, hypoxia and warming. <coughs> and on the plagues, definitely fish kills, proliferation of invasive species, decline of vegetated coastal habitats, and decline of megafauna. So I would say that those here are sort of documented and proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Those are significant objective problems. But I'd like to put some question marks on some of those. So increased jellyfish, jellyfish blooms, well, perhaps we need to look into that. Increased harmful algal blooms, well, perhaps again, we need to look at the evidence. And ocean acidification, we perhaps need to look at that again. And I'm going to focus on those question marks for the rest of the talk and maybe derive some lessons that we can apply in sorting out how we're going to prioritize the problems in the coastal ocean and our actions to remediate those problems. And the reason why we need to uh, scrutinize this further is that uh, there's evidence that we, uh, in the academic uh, community, sometimes incurred in errors when we uh, cite and refer to work. So this is a paper from 2002 on um, <clears throat> on a referencing errors and undermining the scholarship and credibility of a particular trait of science. And they found using a citation network that scientists in that particular discipline were usually miscitating work and actually uh, carrying forward misconceptions that were not supported by the work they were citing in support. And this is in a different field, but in 2010 a paper was published where uh, a few authors evaluated the literature on marine ecology, and they found that one in four citations in marine biology papers is inappropriate. So you cannot really trust everything, everything you read in papers. You need to go back and look at the data. And if the statements are supported by references, you need to go back to the primary source and assess the evidence. But we now have to read so many papers that we rarely have the time to do that, but it's worth doing. So I did start by looking at this problem of the global increase in jellyfish. And there's been many reports of increase in jellyfish, for instance, in Europe, a giant jellyfish in Japan. These creatures are, can, can reach two meters in diameter, and they're really scary and very large. And actually, they cannot be missed. Uh, nearby here in Chesapeake Bay, there's been also a report of increases in jellyfish, and also in the Black Sea and Baltic Seas. And this seems to be a plague that is very difficult to fight. So then convinced that we need to do something about it, then I set up to, <laughs> com to fight the plague the best I could, which was to eat jellyfish. And I actually didn't find it terribly enjoy enjoyable, so I thought that perhaps rather than try to fight the plague, I need to go back and assess if there's actual uh, basis for this place plague to be real. So I went to the first paper I quoted, this historical overfishing and the recent collapse of coastal ecosystems by Jeremy Jackson cited 3,000 times. And the, the paper talks about the litany of changes, including outbreaks of jellyfish. And it gives a reference to support this statement, which is reference 79. So you go to reference 79, and that's a book chapter by Roger Newell. And then you go to find the book chapter, and you read it. And the book chapter is about oysters. Yeah, there's actually nothing about jellyfish. So. 
So that, that was interesting. So then you go to the other paper that I cited on ecological extinction and evolution in the brave new ocean, which says that transforming ecosystems impacts are transforming ecosystems into microbially dominated ecosystems with boon and post cycles of toxic dinoflagellate blooms, jellyfish, and disease. And there's only one statement about jellyfish in the paper that says the Mississippi Delta dead zone is hardly dead however, but supports an extraordinary biomass of diverse microbes and jellyfish that might constitute the only surviving commercial fishery. But this is supported by no reference. And in fact, uh, uh, William Graham, or Monty Graham, that uh, works with us, he's published work that shows that there's no more jellyfish in the dead zone of the Mississippi River than there is anywhere else in the Gulf of Mexico. So again, perhaps these two statements that we could take from very reputable journals like the Proceedings of the National, National Academy of, of Sciences and Science, maybe they need to be investigated further. So we assemble a working group of uh, most of the experts that work on jellyfish. There are not that many. There's probably uh, 50 people or so that work on jellyfish around the world to really try to uh, look critically at the evidence behind the conception that jellyfish blooms are increasing globally. And we published last year this paper where we questioned the rise of gelatinous zooplankton in the world ocean. And we actually looked at the literature and we found no, no assessment or analysis that supported that jellyfish were uh, raising globally. There were examples, case studies, but nobody had done the global analysis required to make that statement. And we uh, discussed how this could come about, that the, the statements that jellyfish are are rising globally is now very, very uh, often found in the literature, but yet the data to sustain this and support this, this statement is nowhere to be found. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not happening. It means that no one has really critically tested that. So uh, we also assembled a database on long-term changes in jellyfish blooms. So uh, to test the hypothesis that jellyfish population sizes and numbers of blooms have not changed significantly in the world oceans. So we wanted to test this. And then we focus on data sets more than 10 years in length, because less than that, it will be hard to tell if that is an increase or just a transient fluctuation. And we collected uh, found records from about, about uh, 42 different areas in the world, most in the northern hemisphere. And collectively, they amounted to a uh, more than one millennia of observation of jellyfish blooms. The longest record came from the Adriatic Sea in the Mediterranean, where there was continuous records of jellyfish blooms from 1700s to date, so 300 years of data. And then we standardized the data because they were using different methods to assess abundance, not a common metric, and then using, used statistical methods to uh, apportion the variability in jellyfish blooms between linear and nonlinear components and also random factors. Well, that's a technicality. But anyway, these are the data sets that we assemble. So this is time. We are not showing the longest record because that's only one line, and it will dwarf those. But these are the different time series that we were able to, assemb to assemble. These scribbles here are the time trends over time. You can see that they do not generally show much of an increase just as, as you look through them. But if you do a statistical analysis on them, then which are reported here, if you take the data from 1940 to 2011, yes, you do find a number of series that show a significant increase, which are those in, in, in uh, red, but you also find a number of series that show a significant decline. And actually, as, about as many that show declining abundances of jellyfish as those that show, as those that show increase. If you narrow the window to 1970 to 2011, there seem to be more of increases, but still not significant. So uh, we also uh, combine all the data, because they were standardized, and we combine them into an average plot of what jellyfish are doing in this sample of the ocean, which is, to the best of our knowledge, that's all we know about long-term changes of jellyfish in the oceans. And then this surprising pattern emerges. So this is the mean standardized abundance of jellyfish. So those are relative units. And then you can see that they go up and down in a consistent manner. So the jellyfish abundance is oscillating in the coastal ocean in a coherent manner, which was very surprising. <laughs> but we, can, we are actually looking at blooms. So we can also look at the, 
a diffraction of the records that were showing blooms in any particular year. And if we look at blooms, this also show an oscillation. And in fact, these oscillations, which have a period of 20 years, uh, account for most of the variability in the data. And there is a small tendency to increase. If you look at the last 20 years, there seems to be a small tendency of, to increase. But in fact, that's because we just reached a high here, and now we're coming to a low. So there's really very little evidence of any increase globally in these jellyfish records. And yet, there is evidence that there's long-term changes of 20 years that have probably been mistaken as increases, whereas they were part of long-term oscillations that defeated everybody's memory, because we don't remember how many jellyfish were in Narragansett Bay 20 years ago. We just, we just forget. So in fact, an example of how we, we can misinterpret uh, trends is provided by this example from the Bering Sea. So this is one of the best uh, data sets on uh, changes in jellyfish comes from the Bering Sea where this, all of these data, all of these stations are surveyed annually to calculate abundance of jellyfish. And then this is the trend between 1975 to 1990. There was evidence for a little bit of an increase the, the black uh, line is the total abundance. The red and the blue are in different sectors of the Bering Sea. But there is evidence for a small increase. But now between 1990 and 1999, there was a huge increase in jellyfish, uh, which actually raised a lot of concern to the people that were doing this work. And a paper was published on increases in jellyfish biomass in the Bering Sea implications for the ecosystem and the role of overfishing in driving this ecosystem towards a dominance of jellyfish, a jellyfish soup. And this is one of the papers that is being used as the smoking gun to support the statements that jellyfish are increasing globally. But these authors kept working. They didn't stop in 1999. And if you look at the data set between 1999 and 2006, then that abundance collapsed to the previous baseline. And they actually reported that and published this uh, work in 2011. But the recent paper cite the former paper, but not this one. So they still cite that the jellyfish are increasing globally, and they cite the Bering Sea, even though the jellyfish population had collapsed. Because the previous paper made waves on the media and really caught everybody's attention. And this other paper has passed unnoticed. In fact, now there's been, in the last three years, there's evidence of another increase coming up, right? So this is one of the smoking guns, and if you looked at this smoking gun, then you can see how, if you just look at this part of the window, you can misinterpret the change as being something like jellyfish are going wild. So in fact, this is a little bit like the game of broken telephone, where people are selectively taking statements, sometimes even distorting the statements when they, uh, they make references and write references in there and citations in their work. And one example of this is from a recent paper from Japan that says that uh, while well, jellyfish populations are increasing in, some, in many water bodies like the Black Sea, the Bering Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico, and for neither one of them, there's evidence of increase. And this type of statement you find over and over and over, sometimes uh, providing regional statements, sometimes saying that this is a global phenomenon. But if you go and look at the primary sources, none of them actually provide evidence for an increase even in those areas, for instance. This is what the Gulf of Mexico does. That is one of the areas that was shown to uh, or argued to provide evidence for an increase. So this is time, changes over time, a bloom here. But then again, like in the Bering Sea, a collapse and going back to background name numbers. And in Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay, that was the example that uh, Jeremy Jackson meant to cite, actually no increase either. So we've done a citation network, and that's a figure that looks a bit complicated, but it's very simple. So this is looking, these are the most recent papers, and those are the papers they cite to uh, support the statements that jellyfish are changing. So are they, there's no trend, there's, there's changing, but no pattern. They, it is uncertain whether they're increasing or not. They might, but it's uncertain. <coughs> they are probably increasing, or they're definitely increasing globally, right? So you can see from the most recent papers to the older papers how uh, which papers are cited by other ones. But the important thing here to uh, notice is that 
If you look at the 1990s, most of the papers are in, in gray, which means that they actually make no statement about a global trend. Some, particularly this one by Claudia Mills, which is one of the co-authors of our recent work, said that in some areas they are increasing, but in some other areas they are decreasing, so it's variable. But this one was picked up by many people, which is the red color, to indicate that jellyfish are, are, are increasing globally. So there was a miscitation of what the author said that was carried forward over time, and eventually was repeated enough times to convey a paradigm, both in the research community, but also in the managerial community, and also in the media, that jellyfish are going wild, and they're going to chew us alive. <laughs> so if you look through papers, and we, we've actually now added more papers here, but if you look through papers over time, then this, this is the growth of the number of papers that make no statement. These are the growth of papers that indicate that jellyfish are increasing globally. So until maybe uh, nine, 2004, very few papers actually said that jellyfish were growing globally. A few did, but that was only five. But between 2004 to present, almost three in every four papers have made a statement that jellyfish are increasing globally. And they make that typically either in the introduction or the discussion. And that provides justification for the work, even for the request for funding. The jellyfish are growing wild, so that we need to address what, what is driving this, and then formulate research questions to address this global increase, which is actually not happening. Okay, so that is a bit disturbance. But the way we believe this works is that there's a feedback loop between the scientific community and the media. So uh, when we publish research and, and run a press release, the media might pick on this, on this uh, press release and make, give it a spin so it becomes newsworthy. And then our colleagues read that paper and they actually believe, read the media statement and they believe the spin in the media paper, in the media statement rather than going back to the paper. So it's a feedback loop between that. And the media conforms opinion because that's what the media is supposed to do. So it builds opinion amongst the public, but also amongst policymakers and also the research community. We are influenced by what we read in the media. And very often we pick research because we read a media, something in the newspaper and then we go back to the original paper. Sometimes we don't go back. We just buy what the media uh, reported. So if we look at the growth of papers on jellyfish ecology in the scientific literature is growing very rapidly. Uh, the number of media statements on jellyfish is growing even faster. And if we normalize this growth by the number of papers on fish, for instance, to, because all of the research output is increasing, then we find that the, num the scientific uh, output on jellyfish normalized to that on fish ecology is actually not increasing. But if we then do the same for media statement on jellyfish versus fish ecology, then we find that the media is increasingly interested in jellyfish and running many stories about jellyfish. And some of them are as interesting as this one. This is one uh, run in 2010. Jellyfish are taking over the oceans. Population surge as rising acidity of world seas kills predators. <laughs> so there we have all of the evidence that really things are going bad. The, the seven plagues are acting, and they are acting together to eventually lead to the oceans becoming a soup of jellyfish. And in fact, this is uh, a statement, and there is a video, so you can this has not been, been misquoted by the, by the media. Uh, Carol Turley from Plymouth University actually has a video where she makes these statements and says that, that ocean acidification has been tentatively linked to increased jellyfish numbers and changes in fish abundance and so forth. And this media statement actually comes after a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of my co-author Rob Condon from this work, which was really about the collapse of jellyfish blooms in the open ocean and microbial use of those, uh, that carbon in the deep sea. It had nothing to do with ocean acidification, it nothing, had nothing to do with climate change, and it had no statement about whether jellyfish were increasing or not. But if you just uh, type jellyfish ocean acidification in Google and Google it, you will find hundreds of media reports uh, echoing this statement that is entirely uh, misrepresenting what the, act the research paper said. So that is conforming opinion, and, and we don't have the capacity to read the 100,000 papers that are published every year on coastal ecology, and sometimes we are influenced by this type of statement rather than going to the original uh, sources. 
So this is a little bit how some of these problems emerge. And we need to be critical of those problems and, and assess the evidence on which they're based. So another similar story, but probably with a different ending, is that of the growth of harmful algal blooms in the ocean. So this figure here shows the growth of reports of uh, harmful algal blooms in the coastal ocean. You can see a very rapid increase in the 70s. And then this increase in reports, which is documented here in those figures that show the number of reports up to 1970 in the ocean, the red dots, and the number of reports in 2009, uh, I think it's nine, has been used to support uh, statements that the number of harmful algal bloom, bloom, brooms are growing. In fact, both this and the jellyfish and many other problems that we'll be talking about tonight have to do with more people being doing, re doing research in the coastal ocean and examining changes in areas where nobody was watching before. So the research effort has increased greatly. There's more people doing observations, more technology to observe these things, and we are now more able to detect these events than in the past. But it doesn't mean necessarily that they are increasing. They might, but that this, an increase in reporting does not mean that these things are growing relative to, to the past. So that is one statement that we need to keep in mind when we look at these seven plagues of the oceans, that some of these changes may have actually occurred in the past, but simply we either didn't have the technology or we were not aware of that being a problem or there wasn't enough of us looking in the coastal ocean to actually detect these things. So there's evidence when we look at the harmful algal blooms that uh, for some areas the uh, frequency of algal blooms have been increasing with population size. These are two examples from Japan, different authors. The increase in population size and the number of uh, uh, events of uh, harmful algal blooms in a particular bay in Japan. So it's some evidence that in some coastal areas these increases are real. But is it a global phenomenon? Maybe not. That isn't really shown yet. And in fact, probably the most comprehensive paper, which was published in Nature Climate Change last year, that uses uh, something called the continuous plankton record that surveys all of the North Atlantic between 1960 and 2009 and look at whether the abundance of diatoms, which are sort of good phytoplankton versus dinoflagellates that often cause these harmful algal blooms, had changed. And in fact, if anything, the amount of diatoms has increased relative to that of dinoflagellates. So perhaps this is occurring in some estuaries, some some coastal areas, but it is not yet proven that it's a global phenomenon. So it, it takes a lot more than a plot of observations over time to actually convince me, and I suppose to convince you, that this is a global phenomenon and they're increasing everywhere. In fact, if we go to some of the longest records available, which is uh, this one, again, from the Bay of Fundy, then it shows from 1944, uh, to 1983, a particular toxin produced by phytoplankton, it shows some events in the late 40s. It shows again events in the 60s, and it shows events perhaps more, of, more frequently in the 70s. But it doesn't really show an increase over time, except that here there seems to be more, but this is from, from a, perhaps the level of detection has changed with technology over this time. But it does show that there's like 15 year cycles possibly on this. And the ocean is a system that shows most of ocean biology and physics show oscillations with a characteristic time scale of about 18 to 20 years. So if you are to pick up two of those cycles, it takes 40 years of observations. And for most of the changes we are interested in the ocean, we actually don't yet have the length of observation to be able to separate these long oscillations from a steady rise. So we are probably misinterpreting things that are oscillations by uh, steady rises. So the consensus on whether harmful algal blooms have increased globally is that some of the apparent increase is actually due to increased scientific awareness, more effort, more people observing, probably not more frequency of those blooms. But there's some areas where those blooms have increased and they may be attributed to increased aquaculture or simply that eutrophication has made uh, phytoplankton to bloom more frequently, more frequently, but the percent of those blooms that are harmful or toxic are, are the same, has not changed. 
And then also there's been a, 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 an objective increase in the spread of the harm, harmful species with ballast water around the ocean. So this is well demonstrated and supported. And is one of the elements that has led to increases in some areas where these problems didn't happen before because the, the species simply went there. Now we can see a very familiar uh, plot in this uh, plot of the number of coastal systems that have been reported to be hypoxic, hypoxic over time. This is from a paper we published in 2008, and that's a very familiar plot. So we see an increase in the number of systems that are reported to be hypoxic, with 5% per year increase in the number of systems that are hypoxic. But underneath this, there's also, again, um, a higher research effort and more people observing. So we need to, we need to separate that from the increase in frequency of hypoxia around the ocean. So this is not, cannot be interpreted that the growth rate of hypoxia, the spread of hypo hypoxia is 6%. That's just our awareness of it is growing at 6%. And in some areas there's been increase, but it's not necessarily true just from this plot that this is growing globally. But the same type of plot with the number of reported cases over, over time has been used to support the statement of hypoxia being spreading across the global ocean. It probably, it, it might, and it probably is doing so, and I believe it's doing so, but these data are not enough to, to support that because they are confounded with the growing scientific effort and more people looking around the ocean for this type of trait. And if we look at two of the dead zones of the ocean that are called dead zones, the Gulf of Mexico, which is the uh, green bars here, and then the other one is the hypoxic volume in Chesapeake Bay, in Chesapeake Bay, we see no obvious increase. In the Gulf of Mexico, there was an increase in the 90s, but then it isn't cre really clear that has increased, or we need to wait longer, because this is only uh, about 20 years, and if this is also subject to long cycles, uh, it might be that we are seeing part of a cycle rather than, rather than a long-term increase. But there are areas where uh, the evidence for increased hypoxia is very robust. These are data from the Adriatic Sea, and this is almost a century of data of oxygen records for the Adriatic Sea, and they show that the oxygen levels have become more viable since the 1960s, and hypoxia is occurring regularly in the period 1970 to 1984, whereas it had not occurred before in 50 years. So this is very solid evidence that for this particular area in the Mediterranean, hypoxia has indeed increased. This is the type of evidence we need to make statements. Just the number of sites is not enough, but this is solid and robust. And for instance, my friends Daniel Conley and Jacob Carstensen published this paper, I believe it was last year, but I didn't write the, the, the time, in Environmental Science and Technology about the Baltic Sea, which was, is one of the systems where hypoxia has been growing and is driving significant efforts from managers and the public to be able to, to address this problem in the Baltic Sea. And they conclude that there's been a steady increase with time since the 1950s, uh, affecting biogeochemical process, ecosystem services, and coastal habitats in the Baltic Sea. But the one figure they provide as evidence is this one. And the w open symbols are the number of profiles, the number of oxygen profiles in the Baltic Sea all across the Baltic, Baltic Sea, sometimes 6,000 per year. But the black one is the frequency of those profiles that show hypoxia. And yes, if you look from 1970 to date, there is an increase, but then you cannot ignore this here, right? So in the 1960s and 70s, there was a higher frequency of hypoxia than there was in the 2010. And yet, the paper said that there was a steady increase in hypoxia since 1950s to date. And so what about this, right? So perhaps, <laughs> again, since 1970 to date, yes, there is evidence on increase, but we can't ignore this. So how we explain that and what role, what was driving that? And the last example for hypoxia that I wanted to show is the longest record of oxygen that I believe exists for any coastal waters that comes from the Delaware Bay. And that was a, a, assembled by Jonathan Sharp and I believe actually the first measurement of oxygen in coastal waters was taken by Benjamin Franklin, which is a, a recurrent figure that I, that, I, that I stumble upon all the time. But you can see that the 
first estimates of oxygen were calling for a rather healthy oxic Delaware Bay, and the oxygen declined significantly to reach almost anoxia in the 1950s and early 60s, and then it slowly recovered again, and now we have values that are not quite the values we had before. Also, there has been warming, so the saturation concentration is less than it was in 130 years ago, but quite a reasonable increase, and that was the time when uh, sewage management was initiated in Delaware Bay. So there was significant increases, but it took 30 to 40 years since the sewage plants where a management was introduced in Delaware Bay to see any hint of an improvement. So you also need to be patient to see, to see improvements. And indeed, many areas have shown hypoxia, so that's a real problem. Uh, to what extent it is global, then we need to assess the data maybe more carefully, but that's one of the plagues of the ocean that is most likely real and we need to be concerned about. But again, we need, we need high quality data and long records to be able to assert that coastal systems are changing. And the last element I was going to touch upon was ocean acidification. So as you probably know, uh, ocean acidification is, uh, refers to the slight decline in pH of the ocean, which is shown here for the station uh, Aloha in Hawaii uh, in green. So there's been a 0.1, about 0.1 unit decline in pH in uh, the Pacific due to the uh, increased, penet sol uh, increased the solution of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. So this is the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere in Manua Loa. This is the increase in CO2 in the ocean surface waters, and this is the result in terms of pH because, as you all know, when uh, CO2 dissolves in seawater, then uh, it generates acidity and the, the pH declines and is very much governed by the amount of CO2 in the, in the open oceans of the, of the ocean. So ocean acidification refers to the decline in pH in the ocean due to the increase in anthropogenic CO2 from the atmosphere as it equilibrates with the ocean. And there's been uh, evidence that uh, many experiments, this actually is a paper we have impressed now, but is based on something like 3,000 experiments of placing uh, different organisms into the pH conditions and the CO2 conditions that the organisms will experience probably in 2100, so by the end of this century. And this zero shows that there is no effect. Below zero says that there is a, a decline in the performance of the individual, and above zero like this shows that there is an improvement in the performance of the individual. So uh, if the error bars extend to zero, these are not significant. So the first thing to notice is that very few of the responses are significant when you throw organisms in a beaker and look at how will they perform under the conditions in 2100. But even when they are significant, the effects are relatively small. So they are 15 to 20% decline in performance, which is not much when you put organisms into the time tunnel and put them immediately in the conditions of year 2100 without any allowance for adaptation or microevolution. So anyway, there is a problem for calcifying organisms, but it's probably not huge. But if we look, for instance, at coral decline in the Great Barrier Reef, and that's a paper published last year, we can see that coral cover has declined in the, in the recent years, and now it's about half of what it was in the 1980s. And the declining growth of corals has been taken as evidence in different papers of ocean acidification already impacting on the corals. But the calcification of corals is affected by anything that affect the corals, not only pH. And in fact, what these authors did in the Great Barrier Reef is they apportioned the decline to different drivers. And they found that the, the most important driver of the decline was tropical cyclones, which are increasing frequency in the area recently and followed by outbreaks of the crown of thorns, which is a predatory starfish of corals that was responsible for a significant amount of the loss. And in fact, they calculated that in the absence of crown of thorn predation, the growth rates would have been positive. So the corals would have expanded rather than declined. And there's no room here for ocean acidification. They found no evidence that ocean acidification has actually impacted the corals in the Great Barrier Reef. 
And in fact, is that when we look at pH in coastal waters, we typically find this type of patterns. So we don't find the slow decline that has been reported for the open ocean in Hawaii or in uh, Bermuda. That is really the slope that is predicted to derive from the solution of anthropogenic CO2 into the ocean. But you can find increases like in Tampa Bay or increases followed by decline. And these declines are five times stronger than the decline expected from ocean acidification. So it cannot be ocean acidification, it's something else. And sometimes you find oscillations that are very large in, in magnitude. So sometimes you find oscillations of up to 0 0.5, 0 0.3 units of pH, which is what is expected to result from emissions of CO2 during the entire 21st century. So the coastal systems are not showing the signal that we expect to see from ocean acidification by anthropogenic CO2. They're showing a diversity idiosyncratic mix of trends, and there's a lot of confusion now in the literature as to what is driving these changes in pH in the coastal ocean. So you have just a couple of, of examples of recent paper. So this one talk of ocean acidification by, amplified by hypoxia in coastal habitats, explain some of these trends, or coastal acidification by rivers. Uh, but I think there's a lot of confusion on this. And we recently wrote a paper entitled Is Ocean Acidification an Open Ocean Syndrome? This was published in March this year. And in fact, there's a lot of confusion between changes in pH and ocean acidification because ocean acidification refers specifically to the effect of anthropogenic CO2 on marine pH. And some of the changes we see in coastal systems have nothing to do with anthropogenic CO2. So there's no role for anthropogenic CO2 in much of this. They are derived from many other things that are happening in the coastal ocean, but not anthropogenic CO2. So it is a little bit like crying wolf. We, we start to see ocean acidification everywhere, whereas ocean acidification is happening and will continue to happen in the open ocean, but it's not clearly happening in the coastal ocean unless we're talking of very arid, arid areas or atolls in the middle of the ocean that are really affected by the open ocean dynamic. Uh, if, if we look at the change in pH in coastal systems, uh, ocean acidification is uh, changing pH globally in the global ocean at a rate of about 10 to the minus 6 pH units per day. If we look at regional changes in pH from existing data, then the rates of change are 10 times higher, uh, 10 to the minus 5 pH units per day, and those are driven by processes in the watershed, land use changes, changes in nutrient inputs, they have nothing to do with anthropogenic CO2. If we look within a particular ecosystem, then seasonal changes and modulated by the residence time of the water in the coastal system drive changes in pH, which are typically of two orders of magnitude higher than those observed at regional levels. And now if we go and look at changes in pH at a specific location in a coastal habitat, then we can find changes in pH of a 0.1 pH units per day or, or 0.5 pH units per day, which is five times greater than the changes that are, can be attributed to anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. So there's a lot of processes that are going on. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I am not aware of any data set for a coastal system that shows clear evidence that the changes in pH are derived from ocean acidification. That is, from anthropogenic CO2. They're changes, but they're derived by other things. So uh, before humans disturbed the ocean, the, one of the drivers were air sea CO2 exchange, and that has been affected by the increased emissions of CO2 and the uptake of uh, CO2 in the global ocean, and also the deposition of uh, acid and bases that we emit to the atmosphere in the ocean, although this is a uh, a relatively minor effect in the open ocean. There's also watershed processes. Before we disturbed the, the biosphere, those were weathering, volcanic activity, changes in ecosystem processes in, in, on land, and also climatic variability that affected rainfall and so on, and eventually affected pH in coastal systems. But now we have introduced marine activities in watersheds that can have huge impacts on pH in coastal waters. One of the rivers in Spain, in Rio Tinto, in southwest, which is the longest 
mine that has been in exploitation for 7,000 years, the pH of that river is 2, right? And it affects greatly the coastal waters and the estuary. Well, that's the pH in the estuary of the river, not in the river. It's even lower. Then uh, we also have this turf in the tropical region, soils that uh, contain acid sulfate, and now we have emissions of acids to the, to the coastal waters from disturbing the watersheds. Changes in land use lead to changes in alkalinity and pH in the coastal water. Agricultural practices and application of fertilizer lead also to changes in pH. Melting and thermocast processes in the Arctic are changing the flux of alkalinity and acids to the ocean. And also, uh, eventually, climate change that is adding to natural processes in affecting rainfall patterns and discharge. And then within the ecosystem, we also have ecosystem processes like community metabolism and the hydrological regime that controls pH in coastal systems. And those are also being uh, affected by human disturbances. So uh, we proposed a concept of anthropogenic impacts in seawater pH that I believe is more appropriate to encompass the suite of processes that affect and govern pH changes in coastal ecosystems, uh, whereas ocean acidification is a very specific process that is applicable mostly or almost only to the open ocean, but is not what is driving pH changes in most of the coastal oceans. So there we need, yes, there is a problem, but it has nothing to do with ocean acidification as affected by anthropogenic CO2. So just to conclude, uh, coastal ecosystems are indeed experiencing a growing number of pressures that act at the global scale, and they're leading to uh, global deterioration of coastal ecosystems worldwide. But uh, the major global problems include overfishing, warming, habitat alteration, eutrophication, chemical pollution, and in some cases, the introduction of invasive species. Like not all invasive species or exotic species are necessarily negative objectively for the ecosystem unless you have a value judgment about one species being more important than other. And despite this, the scientific community and the media have alerted to the existence of additional global problems or plagues without sufficient critical assessments. Uh, where these problems sometimes are local, sometimes are regional, certainly not global, and sometimes they're simply not existing. So there are many problems that we are busy with and that distract the managers and also dilute the resources that are available to address the real problems that are being dispersed now into addressing problems that might not be such problems, or at least not global. There might be problems locally, but maybe some of them not globally. So inadequate citation practices allow some of these misconceptions to propagate over years and become eventually accepted without being challenged. So we need to be critical of what we read and go back to the original sources and challenge the strength of the evidence that we're presented uh, with. An increased observation effort often reveals problems that went, went unnoticed in the past, but that might not be unprecedented, not necessarily increasing. So we need to be aware of that. When we are confronted with a plot of increasing problems with time, we need to ask how much of that is because we are looking closer closer or we are looking more, and how much of that is actually real increases. So we need to apportion both. And confusion between cause and effect might also generate confusion and misguide remedial actions. Because if managers are alerted that ocean acidification is impacting on oyster reefs and, and fishery resources in the coastal ocean and you need to take action, that will drive the managers to act on the emissions of anthropogenic CO2, whereas actually that has nothing to do with what's causing the change in pH. Maybe just a, a consequence of eutrophication that we've known for years, but now we are confounding that with the, the wagon of ocean acidification. And I believe that a more critical diagnostic of coastal pressures and impacts, local, regional, or global, and the drivers behind this will improve how we allocate our efforts and resources to address the many problems that we have in the coastal ocean but that probably and hopefully are fewer that sometimes we are, we are told are affecting the oceans. And the corollary to N, which I borrowed from my lunch meeting, is that, like it or not, science is a social enterprise. So that social activity is affected by opinions, by misconceptions, is affected by biases of people, is affected by how the media portrays the problems, 
and we need to somehow extract ourselves from that social context and be able to uh, assess the evidence and in sending and receiving information remain skeptical and do not buy necessarily the litany of problems and plagues that we are told affect the coastal ocean. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I ran over time. I always do. <laughs> Sorry, the, the present. Long term commitment to monitoring seems to answer the question of the visitors. Yes. Tourism. Yes. What's your view of the global status of the world? Oh, that's uh, absolutely critical. That uh, There was a paper published two years ago that made an, an assessment of the availability of data on ecology in general, not only coastal, but on ecology in general. And they concluded that only 20% of the data that had been on supporting uh, published papers. So not unpublished. Published papers, only 20% of the data was available after publication. So 80% of the data that is reported in papers is actually not available and lost. And that's a minor fraction of all the data we are losing. So collecting data in the coastal ocean is extremely important. It's also very costly and it's precious. And it, it all support, it's all supported by public efforts and funds. And we need to find a way to be more responsible with our data and give due weight to the role of observations and long-term observations in the ocean. So I'm, I'm, I wrote a piece for, an invited piece for a perspective in science about, about the importance of long-term observation programs, and I'm now making some changes, because I believe there will be some change soon, and is that all of you know that, at least that those of you who, uh, your job is partially to publish papers, that there's been a drive to have those papers published open access. Mm -hmm. So it's a requirement that now papers that we publish that have been funded with public funds, they are provided with no uh, cost in the web, right? So everybody can access that science that have been published with public funds. So that's been a, a big movement and a big change in the publishing world that has already overcome those barriers that you need to have a subscription to be able to read the research that you public uh, paid for. Now the new wave that is coming up is public uh, open access data. And the EU is launching now the next uh, seven year framework program that will uh, have a total budget of uh, about 85 to 90 billion euros for the next seven years. And it will be a requirement that all data that is produced with that funding is made available in a public, in a public forum. And there's now platforms that are being developed to be able to publish data sets. So it's very important that we publish our data and make it available and publish the data along with information that allow us to interpret the value of those data. But that is now becoming possible and there are several platforms now that allow you to publish data sets. And now you can even get credit for publishing a data set. You get a citation as you do for a paper and you can take credit for your contribution to publishing data. And some years now, some years down the road, Probably we will be evaluated for our contributions to the published literature, but also our contributions to making our data available. But that's absolutely important, and that's one, one element that we need to improve because assessing those problems require high-quality time series data for the coastal ocean. <laughs> yes. So the first question, I think it's, it's really, mm, well, you could, you could charge the editor or the reviewer with preventing this type of miscitations from propagating to the literature, but really it's the responsibility of the reader. So if you read a statement, and it's a statement that is, will have some bearing 
in conforming your worldview of science or something, you can't just stop at the statement and the reference. You have to go and look at the original paper. We know that, we've been told that many times, but we rarely do it. So I think that, well, you can have the gatekeepers, the editor and the reviewers change, change with that, and they are responsible for some of that, but it's really the reader that should have, should be a skeptic, as, as Scott says, and should also do uh, her or his work and check the references that is presented with. And the second part of the question was on the reaction on the site. On the reaction, yes. Well, uh, I've, I probably I probably won't get won't get very popular, but <laughs> I don't mind I don't mind g being popular. I think it's good to uh, be critical, and I think it's good that we are self-critical and assess the robustness of these problems, because uh, I think right now uh, the environmental sciences and and marine scientists are under public scrutiny, and the integrity of our science and research must be uh, preserved absolutely for us to maintain our credibility. And in the same way that in the politics there is a, a, a divide between different fields as to, for instance, issues like climate change and some other, I think that sometimes we might be inclined to conform our research to a worldview that humans are impacted on the biosphere without being sufficiently critical. And it's not that we are not. There's plenty of evidence that we are, but I'm sometimes annoyed that we keep distracting the public, the managers, and the policy makers with presenting them with new problems every year, mm -hmm. and problems that are not issues. So that, all of a sudden, for instance, ocean acidification two years ago became the key issue in the perception of policy makers and the one that was the most significant impact on the oceans. And I think that that is a disservice to the stewardship of our planet, because it, it is, it might be a problem in year 2100, maybe. I don't think it'll be a problem in coastal systems because they're driven by something else, but it might be a problem in the open ocean by year 2100. But if we don't take care of the problems that are already occurring today, there won't be any coral reefs to be affected by, by ocean acidification by year 2100. So we have too many problems, and we keep, we sort of indulge in coming up with new problems and dumping new problems in the portfolio of the managers and policy makers. And we need to help with providing some sort of a scoring of what problems are the ones that need action today and which problems are, maybe some are value judgments, for instance, some elements of uh, invasive species. There's a lot of value judgment in, in whether this is a problem or not. In some cases, some other cases, an obvious problem, but in some cases, whether you like this Spartina or this Juncus, or you prefer that other, really might be little basis to argue about. But we need to rank the problems and make sure that sufficient resources and policy actions go into addressing the problems that are more detrimental to our coastal systems. And that's an exercise in responsibility. And I think that we are sometimes not being sufficiently responsible. So I, I, won't, get, I won't get very popular, but the work in Jellyfish on miscitations is being presented at a conference on jellyfish. This, uh, yeah, but we are protected because many of the authors of that paper are actually some that are pointed out as as incurring in miscitation. So we we first declare our guilt, and then we present this as a syndrome that is not only us but is really the whole community. So the whole community on jellyfish was somehow they bought in the concept that they were going uh, are racing globally. And they work within that paradigm because it's a convenient paradigm to justify your research, to put in your introduction, and so on. But we were not critical enough. I don't work on jellyfish, but my colleagues do. And they, each of them is in one of those citation networks as being incurred in the, in the scene of miscitation. So we are guilty first, but realizing that we've been guilty of that, let's do something about it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really surprised by by your learning on the over-reporting of scientific problems in, in the general media. I agree that things may be exaggerated, but as scientists, I don't think we have a problem of having too much attention directed to our problems, mm -hmm. to, to scientific issues, rather. And I also think you're setting the bar extremely high that scientists have to be presenting possible remediations, possible answers for policy. How do you? How do you suggest scientists go about getting attention to the problems without having to cry wolf or 
know, well, uh, I think that, it, yeah, yeah, no, no, I understand, I understand what you're saying, and I've been in your, in your sort of side of the question for 30 years. So during 30 years, my work has been about reporting on the deterioration of the oceans and the dem demise of the oceans and many ecosystems I work on, they're no longer in existence. They've disappeared. And I'm extremely frustrated of that. But I did find that whereas we should report on those problems, reporting on those problems have not helped a single bit in curbing the trajectories, unfortunately. So I will be deeply frustrated if by the time I retire, then some of the, some of the ecosystems I work with, like the seagrass meadows in the Mediterranean, are no longer there. And they might be extinct by 2050. So it is, it is a likely scenario. I never meant to be uh, a paleoecologist. I, I wanted to work in ecosystems that will become bi will remain vibrant and, and alive, but I've been di deeply frustrated by just reporting the problems. And I think that our, our uh, society is up to here with problems. We have problems with economy, problems with our jobs, problems with our kids, problems with our family members, health, and a whole bunch of things. So when we present the public with problems and expect them to take action on them, I found that they take action on those problems where they, they have a sense of responsibility in terms that they can do something about the problem. If they, if they acknowledge the problem but they feel they cannot do anything to remediate the problem, they will expect that somebody else will do something about it. And that's why, even though even though the public understands that many of these things are serious problems that need to be addressed, they actually don't do anything about it. And if you survey people that work on climate change, scientists that work on climate change and are convinced that emissions of um, greenhouse gases are affecting the climate system and that's dangerous, and ask them, okay, so how many of you drive a four-wheel drive? How many of you, you'll find, that, you'll find that there is some inconsistency between what they know should be done and what they're actually doing. But, I mean, that's, that's we, we have contradictions, and we, live, we don't live in a bubble. We live in a society that offers different, different ways of uh, lifestyles, and we cannot just produce our own lifestyle for ourselves and impose it on others. So I found that this pathway of documenting problems, we need to do it when they're serious, but I feel that we are sometimes overscaling problems, presenting things that we are not really sure that they're big problems as as if it is the next biblical, biblical plague that is coming upon us. And we don't, we don't do enough in providing solutions. And I, I believe that we were discussing a little bit the trajectories of funding for academic research internationally. Uh, in Europe, in Australia, here, the funding horizons for academic research are only going to shrink with time. And it's going to be increasingly hard to get a job in the US in science with time. But I think that if we are confronted with that type of scenario, then we, we should demonstrate society the value of our research. And that's not just about publishing research and documenting problems. We need to document a broader impact of our research and that if we uh, apply our intellect and talent to do something about the problems, we can actually guide society into addressing the problems, not just, not just reporting on the problems. So I think that Possibly that was good enough 20, 30 years. Also, we had fewer of the problems. So 20, 30 years, nobody was really talking about climate change or ocean acidification was not in the horizon. Jellyfish blooms, who knows? But the number of problems keep growing with time, and the expectations of society that we do something about them keep growing with time. And remember that most of our research and salaries are paid by, by society, and I think we, we will have a better future, and I'll feel better as a scientist myself is I, if I pair my work in reporting problems with doing something about hopefully solving them.
problems and they talk about just the details. But so how do we communicate, how do we figure out what the solutions yeah. are? And importantly, how do we communicate them to the decision makers in ways that they will actually read yeah. and understand? Yeah, in fact, some colleagues that do acknowledge that they over-report problems in their papers, but also in the media, they argue that even though they're aware that they are over-reporting problems in terms of magnifying the problems, that they don't feel a problem with that because they, the outcome is good, that the outcome is to drive attention to addressing something. So even though they probably have ex exaggerated, maybe that's what it takes for policymakers to take action. So that's one. One opinion I've heard from some colleagues justifying magnifying problems with the media. Of course, policymakers don't read papers, but they do read the media, and they react to the media, and they react to concerns of their constituency. So once you close that loop from the paper to the media report to the public being concerned, then all of a sudden becomes a matter of interest to the, to the policymaker. But so, so I think that overreporting eventually can eventually can impact on policies and maybe even misguide efforts, as I was indicating earlier. But I think that the, so what I went to do in Australia is I want to work on solutions because I think it's possible, and I think it's possible because uh, sometimes we're very focused on the detail and very focused on the problem and so on, and sometimes the solutions, not to the big problems, but say modest solution to small problems are sometimes within a, an arm reach. And in my own research, uh, there's been three cases where my research has been of some uh, consequence in solving problems or creating opportunities, but it didn't happen because I was pursuing those opportunities or solutions. It happened in a serendipitous way, and sometimes those solutions were actually picked up by someone else. And I realized that instead of Instead of closing my job when the paper get published and maybe do a press release in hopefully a good journal, then I, I follow up and look at whether the products of my research can be useful in solving problems, maybe in the subject of, our, of my research or somewhere else. Then I think that very often, if we do not rely that entirely to serendipity, we can actually have a much broader impact of our research. And I personally felt a lot better when my research was of practical significance than when I just published it in research papers. Because then you just add one small feather to your hat and then you move to the, to the next thing. But if you can somehow improve a problem or something that is of consequence for the lives of some people, or even if it's a small community or a small group, you really feel good about the service you're making. And that sort of delivers, delivers confidence in the value of research, both to those people and, and, to, and to our own. And I believe that also if we, guide, if we guide society through a pathway of solutions and opportunity rather than hammering them every day with the problems and guilt, I think we are more likely to have them address the problems than if we just, if we just hammer them with the, with the guilt. Because at one point you become immune to that discourse. No, I'm feeling that they have more. Yeah, and I think it's actually, it's actually uh, well, better. It is what it is. If it's local, it's local. If it's global, it's global. But if it's local instead of global, then we can actually do something about it with a lot more confidence in success than if it's a global problem that has to do with what people do in remote areas and so on. But if it's a problem that is confined to our watershed that we can manage, then we, uh, our confidence that we can do something about it is much greater. So that's also why it is important to discriminate between the local, the local components of problems and the global components. The global components are very difficult to address. You can, you can have a small contribution, but if the component, if the problem arises within your watershed and something that is going on in your watershed and your community, 
then you can certainly do something about it. Or you are in a better position to do something about it that if it's a global problem. So recognizing those two is very important in terms of acting upon the problems.